لم نشرح لك ووزان أنك بزرك الذي ينقذ ظهرك ورفانا لك ذكرك فإنما الأسر يسرى إنما الأسر يسرى فإذا فرغت فانسب وإلى ربك فرغب The translation as follows Have we not expanded for you your chest and we have removed from you your burdens from your back which weighed upon your back and raised high for your reputation so indeed with hardship is ease indeed with hardship is ease so when you have finished your duties then labor hard to worship allah and to your lord turn to your attention sadaqullah alazim back to you to back to you dr fazala jazakal khair barakallahu feekum sir assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to everyone alhamdulillah it's a beautiful sunday evening and today as we celebrate uh, teachers day on behalf of team gdp i would like to extend a very warm welcome to all the uh, fellow colleagues who have agreed to join us this sunday evening uh, a very warm welcome once again so let's begin um, as robert john rightly said an exemplary teacher will not just enlighten the student but will also empower the student now this is exactly who my teachers are and today i am super excited and my happiness knows no bounds as i introduce to you my favorite two teachers uh, whom i have been in constant contact with all through my education and my career uh, dr mohammad faizuddin sir and uh, dr fauzia tarannum who have humbly accepted to kick start gdp webinar series 2.0 as the panelist and the speaker respectively welcome sir and welcome ma'am Uh, with special excitement i would like to share a few words about uh, fazuddin sir uh, he is one of my favorite teachers uh, the greatest legacy that anyone can leave behind is to positively impact others lives and this is exactly what uh, fazuddin sir does uh, he has tirelessly been involved in teaching guiding mentoring and uh, you know moreover taking care of so many undergraduates postgraduates phd students for more than 3 to 4 decades now he has been a professor and head of the department of gdc of mradc he has had over 42 publications in both international and national journals he has also been an editor in chief of various journals and what i would like to mention today especially because it's a teachers day uh, program and a teachers day specialist sir has received the eminent teachers award by the rajiv gandhi university and he also has received the distinguished teacher award by the bangalore academy of periodontists and i'll have to mention this that sir is among the very few chosen indians uh, indian professors who has been given the title professor emeritus now sir we are very humble to have you join us today i would now request dr safia to introduce yet another dear teacher of mine and also the speaker of the day dr fauzia tarannum she is one person who is never too busy for her students she has she always has my back and she loves her students unconditionally and uh, she is a dynamic speaker she holds the interest of all her audience through her crystal clear speech and yes of course because of her immense knowledge of the subject over to you dr safia assalam alaikum thank you dr gazala uh, it is an honor to introduce dr fauzia tarannum an accomplished periodontist ma'am has graduated with a bachelor's degree in dental surgery from mr ambedkar dental college and hospital she went on to do her masters and phd in periodontics from the same college she is currently working as an assistant professor in the department of periodontics at M mr ambedkar dental college and hospital bangalore she has more than 10 national and international publications to her name and is an excellent guide to her undergraduate and postgraduate students ma'am is a proficient clinician with immense interest in academics and research as william arthur ward said a medical teacher tells a good teacher explains and the superior teacher demonstrate demonstrates whereas a great teacher inspires thank you for inspiring generations of students ma'am we would like and we would we are very happy that you are here today to uh, kick start this uh, webinar uh, series 2 welcome ma'am 
Thank you, Dr. Safia. Now, coming to the topic, preservation versus restoration of the tooth. And this is an excellent topic to ponder upon as dentists, because no matter from which field of dentistry we belong to, retention of periodontally involved tooth, as opposed to tooth extraction and then subsequently uh, replacement, is one of the most difficult and multi-factor dependent uh, uh, you know, decision that we as dental professionals face on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. Now, today our speaker, Dr. Fauzia Ma'am, will help us in understanding the correct route that we must take. She will enable us, uh, you know, to make the right choice in the decision making regarding when should we be sacrificing a tooth and when will a tooth be considered sound and salvageable. I would now like to invite Dr. Fauzia Tarannum to take over the session. Please, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Ruzala, for a wonderful and a very warm welcome. Thanks to Dr. Safia for a very uh, elaborate introduction. And uh, it's an honor for me today. In fact, it's a little emotional. My name has been taken together along with my teacher. Teacher is not a word for sir that I can use. If I say he's my godfather, it's still small for him. He's my mentor, he's my guide. And on Teacher's Day, my name being taken together along with sir, when Ghazala said two eminent teachers, my joy knew no bounds. To a second, uh, I was happy. But at the same time, I was feeling I'm a really worth sharing the same statement along with sir. Anyway, thank you, Ghazala. You, you made me fly very high for a few seconds. Uh, I thank the group Global Dental Professionals for giving me this opportunity. Though I am not very active on the group, I think I should apologize for it. I am basically very busy. I will not have time to reply messages. I rarely make attempts to kind of clarify clinical doubts because I'm confident Ghazala can do it better than me. Anyway, I thank everyone. Uh, I thank Dr. Rausia, the organizing team. I think uh, Dr. Nadim, uh, Dr. Nair, Dr. Asim, these are all uh, the leaders for this group who keep the group active. Thank you very much. And uh, I uh, wish a very happy Teacher's Day to all of you. We are teaching and learning. Teaching learning is a continuous process. We don't have to be professionally teachers to teach something. You know, teaching and learning happens at every stage of life, at every instant. Uh, without uh, wasting much time, uh, I would like to begin my presentation. The screen is visible? Yes, ma'am. Ma yes, ma'am. Is it on the full screen mode? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. So I have slightly modified the topic. I had just mentioned as preservation versus restoration of tooth. I'm a periodontist, so habits die hard. So I had to mention periodontally involved tooth because I'm nobody to comment on endodontically involved tooth or other uh, problems that dentition have in the oral cavity. So I have restricted the uh, presentation to Preservation versus restoration of periodontally involved tooth. I would like to begin my presentation saying, Rabbi Zidni Ilma. I am not very elaborate with uh, uh, Quranic knowledge and deen. What little I know, I thought I should start my presentation with this. Increase in knowledge is what can keep us going, can help us to grow can help us leave a legacy behind which our generations can follow. So I hope this session helps us, helps you, helps me, helps everybody in increasing the level of knowledge each of us possess. Now, to begin with, we are all dental practitioners. We are all here to basically treat all the dentition related issues to some extent, yes, oral health issues. So the goal of dentistry is basically to preserve the natural dentition in an optimum state of health, function, and aesthetics, and of course, for the lifetime of an individual. 
Now, various branches of dentistry deals with various problems. Endodontic treatments, restorations of lost teeth, oral surgical issues. Now, the main stay for dental practice is replacement of missing teeth. Just a second. So this is Divan's golden statement, well said. He says, the preservation of what remains is more important than the mere replacement of what is missing. See, as dental surgeons, as dental practitioners, all our concentration is on, we want to replace what is missing. In that process, we really ignore the aspect of preserving what is already existing. Now, today's topic is basically, you know, whether to preserve a tooth or to extract a periodontally involved tooth. Now, there are various reasons for tooth extraction as I have listed here. There are grossly decayed teeth, traumatic injuries, fractures, endodontic failures, of course, severe periodontitis, orthodontic reasons, and impacted teeth. So our discussion today is going to restrict to the situation where there is severe periodontitis. Now, this is just basically various stages of periodontal disease wherein, you know, it begins with simple gingivitis where there's absolutely no effect on the alveolar bone level. Gradually, there is bone loss, which increases to an extent where the tooth becomes mobile. Now, I would just like to begin the presentation with some small statement from Hamlet by William Shakespeare, a very famous quote, to be or not to be, that is the question. So for us, to extract or not to extract. Now, how do we decide whether to extract the tooth or not to extract and salvage it and maintain it? So we'll have to estimate what will be the longevity of the tooth after our treatment, then decide whether to extract or treat and maintain. So basically, in scientific terms, we have to determine the prognosis of the tooth. What is prognosis? This is a small definition from our textbooks. This is basically a process where we're going to predict what will be the course and duration and outcome of a particular disease. And so also, what will be the outcome after the treatment? Now, to decide on the prognosis of a periodontally involved tooth, there are various factors. Teacher by nature, you know, habits die hard again. I, I have to kind of make a presentation like a theory class, whether it is for practitioners, whether it is for students. So I have just listed some factors here, which are broadly classified into general factors and local factors. Now, why do we need this? You know, why do we classify that as individual tooth factors and then overall factors? Why do we need to describe prognosis under individual tooth prognosis and overall prognosis? Now, overall description of prognosis basically is meant for communication. Now, if you have to communicate with the practitioner saying, what is the overall prognosis for this patient? So that is when we need an overall description. Now, the general factors that I have listed basically are going to affect the whole dentition. But when we talk about local factors, it is restricted to that one particular tooth which we are talking about or which is in question. Again, periodontal disease, does it progress uniformly throughout the dentition? It is tooth specific. It is area specific. In fact, it is site specific. So we have to enlist the factors for local. Now, some of the sites can have deep probing depths. There are molars. So it is different for posterior teeth. It is different for anterior teeth. So we have to have a separate list for individual tooth prognosis and overall prognosis. Now, when we talk about individual tooth prognosis, that is, we want to decide the prognosis for a tooth in question. So there are various anatomic factors that we talk about and various prosthetic and restorative factors. Now, we cannot take a decision at random. How? How do we decide? There have to be certain guidelines to make this decision making. I have said there are so many factors that affect overall prognosis, individual tooth prognosis. Now, when we say there's one particular tooth in question, we have to decide whether to retain it or extract it. Now, there was one survey grossly done, you know, to decide how the practitioners actually decide. Some people decide based on mobility. 
some rely only on the severity of attachment loss. This is a common term that we use for periodontal disease, attachment loss and bone loss. So this is a various percentage of people, you know, how they use the prognostic factors to decide. Now here, basically, they're using only one particular factor. Now, this is another uh, way of deciding, you know, whether the tooth is hopeless according to the periodontal disease progression or the periodontal disease severity. There's another list of factors here, which, you know, we at least try at least two of the following criteria should be met. That is more than 75% of bone loss, a pocket depth of more than eight millimeters, great trifurcation involvement, hypermobility. Now, again, if you look at it, these are not very specific factors. And we are missing many other factors here. You know, there are only few which are included here. So people have come up with different classification schemes over a period of time. All of us should remember that there is no simple and straightforward answer. You cannot say, okay, just tell me what to do with this. You know, we just cannot say, okay, this is the mobility of the tooth. You know, this is a general tendency of the practitioners. I have had, you know, 14 to 15 years of perio practice. People call up and say, madam, uh, there's one grade two mobile teeth. What do we do with it? Do we retain it? Do we extract it? I always say, no, I need to examine. See, there are situations where we can salvage, we can, you know, kind of treat and maintain a grade two mobility tooth. But there are situations where it is difficult even to maintain a grade one mobility tooth. For example, you have a situation where it's a grade one mobile first molar, upper or lower, second premolar is missing. So they ask, okay, what is the prognosis? What to do with this? It's just grade one mobile. But then we forget that it is to serve as an abutment tooth. So to serve as an abutment tooth, even grade one mobility is difficult. It becomes questionable. Same situation. It is part of an entire dentition, grade two mobile teeth. Yes, definitely we can. Of course, we have to consider so many other factors. So there are guidelines. This is again very subjective. It differs from patient to patient. So there are various people who have come up with various classifications. You know, this is all very historical. 1978, there was one classification who said, okay, if these are the criteria, then, you know, it, it comes under questionable prognosis. Then some who just said, okay, there's one questionable, there's one hopeless. So if these criteria satisfy, you know, we can kind of consider it as hopeless and extract the teeth. Now, again, here, if you see all the factors that I've listed are not there. Now, this is another elaborate. Now, these are two people, Dr. McGuire and Martha Nunn. They have done extensive work where they have followed up, you know, severe periodontitis cases for 10 years follow-up, severe vacation involvement, 10 years follow-up, and, and they have given wonderful uh, research uh, data. So, they have come up with this classification. This was very commonly used. In fact, as students, this is what we have learned, you know. If you see the first criteria there, 25% of attachment loss. 50% of attachment loss, more than 50% of attachment loss, furcation involvement. So these are the criteria used here. Again, here, it doesn't cover all the prognostic factors. Now, this is another guidelines that were given in 2007, you know, where they said, okay, depending on the periodontal stability. Now, look at the key word here. I think henceforth in my presentation, this word will keep coming up again and again, maintenance. Periodontal treatment is one, maintenance is another. Now, most of us concentrate only on the treatment. Okay, it was a perio case. Scaling was done. Surgery was done. And then it's done. No, it's not done. There's something called as maintenance. That means the patient has to come back to us regularly. We have to do scaling and root planing periodically. That can again vary from patient to patient. So this word is the key for periodontal patients. Now, treatment and maintenance if there is good periodontal stability, that comes as favorable, okay? There may be periodontal stability that becomes questionable. Achieving periodontal stability is unlikely that goes unfavorable. And then there's something called as hopeless where we don't get any periodontal stability at all. So it goes for extraction. Again, these are not sufficient for people. You know, it's just nice to read, nice to write for answers, but very difficult for decision-making. Now, this process, you know, this is an elaborate process and uh, of what I have seen from the literature, this is one of the very elaborate way of a decision-making process. But if understood and followed, a very genuine and, you know, kind of we can rely upon. It's a very reliable method. Okay, here there are different levels of decision-making. You know, it is divided into different levels. There are six levels. We have to deal one by one, you know. We have to deal one one level in a separate manner. Now, when we are talking about this, there are color codes that are used here in this decision-making process. If it is green, 
long term maintenance favorable that means very favorable we can go ahead we can treat and we can save there is no doubt about it proceed with caution is recommended that means again as i mentioned whether the tooth is serving as an individual tooth or it is serving as an abutment we have to be careful here here long term survival unfavorable that means if it is for short term yes you can try but if the patient is asking for long term survival then it goes into this category now this is red with the nasteric if this is there, then it strongly suggests an extraction. Now, I just have to explain certain terminologies that are used here. So this is just to get uh, familiarity with that. So there's probing pocket depth, alveolar bone loss. Now here, probing pocket depth less than 5 mm is under the green category. I have mentioned the codes there. 5 to 7 is yellow. More than 7 is red. That means this is favorable. This is deal with caution this goes into the extraction category, okay? Probing depth is very commonly used as a measure of periodontal disease. And if you see this criteria, less than five, five to seven, more than seven, this is classified as, you know, mild periodontitis, moderate, severe periodontitis. Similarly, extent of alveolar bone loss. Now, alveolar bone loss is a radiographic finding, but the amount of alveolar bone loss can be measured clinically in the form of attachment loss. Very familiar term with the periodontists, but not very common with the practitioners. You know, they are familiar with pocket depth and bone loss. Now, here's the difference. See, pocket depth is basically the distance between the gingival margin to the base of the pocket. Now, this base of the pocket is where your junctional epithelium has migrated to. In health, junctional epithelium is supposed to be at the cemento enamel junction. When there is periodontal disease, the junctional epithelium migrates over the root surface and is present at the base of the pocket. So if you take a probe and try to measure the depth, you're measuring the distance from here to here. That is your pocket depth. Now, what is this attachment loss? Is the actual attachment loss. The periodontal fibers are attached into the cementum. So the amount of PDL fibers which are lost here is the attachment loss. And that is the distance between cemento enamel junction to the base of the pocket. Now, another very important factor or a periodontal measure, measure of periodontal disease severity is focation involvement. Of course, it is only for the posterior teeth. There are different classifications for focation involvement, uh, but a very user-friendly classification is this. Of course, to do this measurement, we need to have a special probe. It is called as neighbor's probe, which is similar to your explorer. So if the furcation has three millimeters of horizontal penetration into the furcation area, it is class one. More than three millimeters, it's class two. And a through and through penetration, that is in a lower molar, if you insert the probe from the buccal surface, you can see the probe exiting from the lingual surface. Again, this is a very dicey situation for the upper molars. So class one goes into code green, class two goes into code yellow, class three goes into code red. Now, another factor, this is a very common thing. You know, if you have to decide prognosis of a periodontal disease, okay, measure tooth mobility, whether it is an anterior tooth, whether it is a posterior tooth, what is the amount of inflammation? We do not consider it tooth mobility. Of course, it is an important measure, but it has to be combined with the other factors for decision-making. It's called Miller's classification, where again, we have three classes, one, two, and three, greater than normal, up to one mm, more than one mm, in horizontal direction. But if you have any vertical movement or depressibility in the socket, it is considered as class three. So no mobility or class one is green, class two is yellow, class three is red. Another thing, very important, we have to check on the crown root ratio. So just the amount of bone loss or just the mobility will not be enough. We have to combine this factor crown root ratio. Now, I think all of us have studied as students, anatomical crown, clinical crown. What is anatomical crown? The distance between the incisal edge or the occlusal level up to the CEJ is the anatomical crown. And then anatomical root is from the CEJ to the root apex. Clinical crown is what you see clinically. That is from the incisal edge to the gingival margin is clinical crown. Okay. So crown root ratio is basically the clinical crown length. So if it is less than one is to one, it is green. One is to one is yellow. More than one is to one is red. 
Now, this is a nice, this thing of uh, crown root ratio again here. Now, if you look into this here, now, if you measure this side, now this is the clinical crown length. So the ratio is almost here is one is to one. Now here, if you see the clinical crown area is more than the root area. So the ratio here is reversed. Now this diagram is basically to explain the center of rotation in a tooth. Now, if you look at this, the prognosis of which tooth is better. Now, many of us may think it is easily A because one side there is more bone loss. No, actually the prognosis is better in this tooth. That is situation A because the center of rotation for the tooth here is more incisally placed. Here it is more apically placed. So this tooth will exhibit greater tooth mobility than this. Now, all these factors that I kind of explained is to understand this. Deciding whether to extract or conserve, this is a decision chart which is done at six different levels. We'll deal one by one. This is first level, which is called initial assessment. And these are the factors that are considered. What are the patient expectations? What are the treatment expectations? Aesthetic concerns, finances, patient compliance. So take one by one. Patient expectations. Patient wants to save? Yes, that is when you can attempt. Patient doesn't want, he's willing to extract. So it easily goes into the red category. Treatment expectations. I think I initially mentioned, sometimes there are short-term expectations. Yes, you can tell yes to the patient, but if the patient is saying long-term, then you have to put it into the red category. Next, aesthetics. If aesthetics are not involved, we are very safe. We can go ahead. But if aesthetics are involved, we have to put it under questionable. Finances again, patient has limited finances, doesn't want to spend for period treatment. Adequate finances come to LO. Patient compliance. Now, what is this patient compliance? As I mentioned, periodontal treatment is not one-time treatment. Patient has to come back for follow. So patient complies by your instructions, comes back. That is a compliant patient. So patient should be willing to come back for maintenance. That is a compliant patient. And oral hygiene instructions, whatever you give, the patient should follow. That is a compliant patient. Very important factor for perio patients. Okay, if there is inadequate patient compliance, then it goes into the yellow category. That was first level. Now coming to second level. This is when we are made. Now if you look, the first assessment was not disease severity on to decide. So many other factors which can influence. So that is the advantage of this decision making. You know, every factor is given weightage. Every factor is considered before we decide to extract or to conserve. So now we are measuring periodontal disease, severity, probing depth, mobility, bone loss, bone defect morphology. What kind of defect are there? It's very uh, refined topic. If I get into it, it gets too much. So I have just tried to present what all are clinically relevant for practitioners when they are examining a patient. Okay. So probing depth, as I mentioned, there are three levels, right? So green, yellow, red. Mobility again, zero or one is green, two is yellow, three is red. Now, there are some patients who report with abscesses. There is a periodontal pocket. All patients don't develop an abscess. Some patients come with abscess. So if the patient is giving history of recurrent abscesses, then it goes into red. No recurrent periodontal abscess, it's green. Coming to the amount of bone loss, less than 30%, 30 to 65%, more than 65%, and bone defect morphology. Now, there are defects which are, you know, deep and narrow, superficial, right? There's a, uh, a very elaborate classification. So I thought it won't be relevant, so I have restricted. Coming to third level. Now, look at this. Furcation involvement is a separate category here because it has so many factors involved in it. It is not included under periodontal disease severity. So we see for what kind of defect this is, that is one, two, and three. So green, yellow, and red. Then interproximal bone level, very important. Now, if you're considering a posterior tooth, you have furcation area, you have interproximal bone, that is between the adjacent teeth. So if the furcation entrance is above, that is coronal to the furcation entrance, then it is green. If the furcation entrance and the bone level is at the same level, then it is yellow. If the interproximal bone is below or more apical to the furcation area, then it goes into the red category. Then, when I was talking about 
two anatomic factors, you know, I had mentioned cervical enamel projections, presence of enamel pearls, some root anomalies. So if you have any of those factors, then the prognosis becomes a little questionable. So it goes into the with caution category. If no such factors are there, then it is no. Now, root resection. If the patient requires a process called root resection, where we, you know, kind of cut off one root of the tooth. If there are no financial concerns, then it is yes. But if the patient is showing financial concerns, then it goes into the no category. The fourth level, we have to consider all the etiological factors. For example, presence of calculus. If we are doing surgery, whether will it compromise the bone there? Retreatment, whether these are patients who have undergone periodontal retreatments. What is the status of roots, whether they are close or they are divergent roots? Then the endodontic status of the tooth. Now, each of these presence of calculus. If there is calculus, then it is yes. If there is more of calculus, then it goes into LO. Surgery compromises bone dimension. If we are doing surgery, it's going to compromise the bone. Yes, if it is compromising, then it goes into LO. If it is not compromising, then it comes into green. Now, when we do periodontal retreatment, once treatment done, it recurs. That is called recurrent. But some patients don't respond to treatment at all. They are considered as refractory. No periodontal retreatment is done. That means it is in the green category. Periodontal treatment done, disease has recurred, it is LO. Treatment done, but it has not responded. That is refractory. If there is root proximity, then it goes into the red category. If we have divergent roots for a periodontal prognosis, teeth with divergent roots have better prognosis. Endodontically treatment done, treatment has failed, then the prognosis goes into straight red category. Root canal treatment done, the treatment was successful, then it is in the green category. Coming to fifth level, the other restorative factors, you know, if there are fractures, there are faulty restorations, presence of caries, crown root ratio, which I have explained, whether the patient requires post core and crown for that particular tooth are again considered individually. There are faulty restorations and you cannot restore them, it is red. If you can restore, it is green. Extensive caries are present, then it goes into yellow. Not presence of extensive caries, it is green. This I have mentioned. Favorable ratio, one is to one is yellow. If it is less than one is to one, it is unfavorable. Post and core is required, the prognosis goes into yellow. We don't need a post and core, it is green. The last level, we consider all the other systemic factors. Systemic factor is not present, it is all green. Systemic factor is present, then it goes into yellow and red. Now, if you look at here, smoking is a very strong factor. If the patient is a smoker, we have to give the code as red. So what we have done so far is we've considered all the factors, graded them according to the categorization here, given them the codes. Now the final decision is made like this. Suppose you have more than three red marks, it goes for extraction. You have two reds with two or less than two yellows, it's extraction. We have two reds, one yellow. One red, more than or equal to three yellow. Or four yellows, consider extraction. One red, less than two or equal to yellow, three yellows, give the treatment. If it fails, then extract. Two yellow. Maintenance may be compromised, but we can still tell the patient we can maintain after treatment. All are green or there's only one yellow. Tooth conservation is recommended. I think it was quite elaborate when I was talking, but now I think most of you would have understood. We consider each factor, give the color code, and then we count how many color codes are there. And then this final thing is used. Now. We have decided, we've done the extraction. What do we do? We cannot leave that, it is lost. We have to go and find it. There are various methods of 
replacing one of you. We are talking about one of you missing. Teeth. We are not dealing with situation where there are totally dangerous cases. So we use implants, we use tooth supported bridges, or of course the removable partial dentures. Implants is considered as the gold standard for replacement of missing teeth as on date. Now, what is implant therapy? Implant therapy is basically replacing the missing tooth by use of the titanium dental implants. It is considered to be safe, predictable. See, we are talking about implant therapy per se. We are not comparing it with anything. Of course, yes. When there is no tooth present, we are replacing it with an implant. And that is what we are talking about. It is safe. It is predictable. It is reliable. Of course, long lasting to treat the patients who have lost some teeth or all the teeth. Now, this is a million dollar question. How do you decide whether to extract the periodontally involved tooth and replace with the dental implants or save the natural dentition? Because every time we have a patient with a missing tooth, it's simple. Okay, we give you the options. Implants, tooth supported uh, fixed partial dentures, removable partial dentures, and we can Claim implants is the best, no doubt about it, because the tooth is not there. We don't have a natural tooth existing there. Patient is come with an edentulous area. Do not hesitate to recommend implant to that patient. You can say it is the gold standard as on date, very reliable, long-term success, because all the other treatments have their own pros and cons, undisputed. You know, implants can definitely be recommended without a second thought, of course, unless you have to see for other factors like systemic condition of the patient, the bone availability, the anatomic factors and all that. Otherwise, at the outset, when you examine a patient, edentulous area, yes, implants is the best treatment. But when it is to extract a tooth and replace, that is periodontally involved, we have to consider all that that we have discussed so far. Yes, this is just talking about what is the survival rate of implants? Wonderful, very good, well-documented. Long-term survival rate has been well documented and they say, yes, it is widely implemented in practice. As I mentioned, no doubt, we don't have to hesitate. We don't have to, you know, kind of think that why are we recommending such an expensive treatment? We have to give all the treatment options. Implant is one among them and it's the best. Now, another thing, what happens to periodontally treated natural teeth? Wonderful results. I mentioned Dr. Maguire and Martha Nen have that extensive work. They've given long-term success rates, 10 years, 15 years. Wonderful. So individually. Now, what is the evidence that, you know, we have to preserve the compromised natural teeth? Now, look at this. I somehow, you know, this is from an internet source. Wonderful result. Look at this situation. You can almost see the root apex of the tooth here. This must have been definitely mobile. That is why splinting is in place. They have attempted surgical therapy with some regenerative procedure here. And look at the results here. It's a surgical re-entry, 100% confirmative result, not a radiograph, not the clinical outcome. Must have been a research work. That is when we do surgical re-entries. So look at the bone. The apex is covered with bone. Wonderful. Every periodontist's dream is this. It's like a dream come true for us. Okay. But yes, there are cases where we can achieve such kind of outcomes. There's, there's no question that, you know, periodontal treatment can give better results. So these are all, you know, basically I'm just trying to give some scientific, uh, this thing, this is what I've learned from Sir. Whatever we present, we have to present with some evidence, okay? So tooth retention, ultimately, where we able to save the tooth is the end point. Now, there was one five-year longitudinal study. Now, look at this. Why do you think I've put this in red? Without maintenance means patient did not follow up. Patient did not come up for follow-up non-surgical treatment. 33% of teeth were lost. Now, these teeth were diagnosed with hopeless prognosis, no doubt. But over five years, 33% lost. 14-year longitudinal study, treated and well-maintained patients, 2.3% of teeth lost. 50% attachment loss was there. So, you know, this is how, you know, we say, yes, periodontal treatment can help retain the teeth. Yes. Teeth with advanced bone loss, can be kept healthy with a strict program of maintenance care. Now, when we say strict program, see some patients may need it at six months, some may need it at three months. That's again a totally, you know, elaborate regime to decide. Like how we spoke about prognosis, we have an entire charting for this, okay? So 
Now, decision of retained compromised teeth is complex. It very strongly depends on what quality of treatment we are giving. We have to consider not only the survival, but also the stability of these teeth. Now, this is again another study, you know, where uh, we had to decide on the molars, what happens, you know, what are the factors that influence, what is the long-term outcome. Now, this study was basically done to analyze factors which influence treatment decision for periodontitis affected molars and to evaluate long-term outcome. A conservative approach to the treatment. When we use the word conservative, we may or not have done surgery over here. Okay, for the molars, even with deep percations, have shown high long-term success rate. Again, look at this. I put it in red. Provided maintenance care is offered. Now, here again in red, the term has changed. Earlier, it was called maintenance therapy. So all the old studies mention it as maintenance therapy, but then later the term was changed to supportive periodontal therapy. This was basically to convince the insurance companies in the Western world. You know, when they said maintenance therapy, the insurance was not covered. So they changed it to supportive periodontal therapy. Now, this was to assist the evidence on disease progression after treatment in patients receiving supportive periodontal therapy. The outcomes remained stable over a period of time. Disease progression reduced number of sites and patients. But the failure was mostly associated with poor oral hygiene, poor compliance with supportive periodontal therapy and smoking. Now, this was to say that, you know, periodontal treatment can retain teeth over a long period of time. So long-term follow-up. Now, we are actually wanting to know whether it is better to extract a periodontal involved tooth than place an implant. So first, let us know what is the comparison between implants and natural teeth. Now. Yes, we are all impressed by the success of dental implants. I mentioned you know, it is true also. So we are under delusions that, you know, that the implants are as good as natural teeth. See, an area is a dentulous. We are replacing it with a dental implant. That is the best possible replacement we can give. See, it's like there are artificial limbs you know, being made for people who lose limbs, unfortunately. But then we cannot say, okay, the limb works functional. So let us remove the limb and try it out. So we have to compare what is the comparison, dental implants, whether they're as good as natural teeth. So we take it for granted. Okay, mild periodontal involvement, mild pulpally compromise tooth, let's place an implant. This is where the decision making plays a critical role. Now here, see, look at this. Even if the teeth are salvageable, basis of convenience, we just say, okay, let's place an implant. Now, this is basic comparison. Of course, see, this is all about the anatomy here, you know, how the fibers are and all that. Now, this is basically a diagram shows. We have to remember one thing. Implant doesn't have PDL. Now, I don't have to explain the significance of periodontal ligament. If it was not significant, then all of us would have had, you know, the tooth and bone junction, like how some of the animals have it. Periodontal ligament plays a very important role in proprioception, shock absorption, in maintaining the bone remodeling, maintaining the bone health. Periodontal ligament is not just meant for the tooth. It maintains the health of the bone around it with the process of bone remodeling, which is absent in an implant. So definitely, it is a compromised situation. It is no way equivalent or superior to natural teeth. Okay, again, a prosthetic restoration cannot compete with the natural teeth when it comes to physical, biochemical, or sensory properties. Now, look at this proprioception, that's the nerve supply, the sensory properties, and adaptation to occlusal forces. We have heavy occlusal forces. Periodontal ligament accommodates it. There can be resorption. There can be formation, remodeling. Nothing of this sort can happen around an implant. Heavy occlusal force, high chances of implant failure. In fact, those are... One of the you know, highest number of failures that happen in an implant is because of the occlusal forces. Now let's talk something about, you know, when do we say implant is successful? When do we say the implant has survived? When do we say the implant has failed? This is very important. You know, we cannot say, okay, we placed implant three years, it's fine, so we can place it. Three years is not a duration to decide. Now look at this. When we say success, we have to have ideal clinical conditions. Now, look at this. It's not placing the implant and deciding. With the prosthetic placement, 
at least 12 months the implant should have been in place when we start to examine it. So early implant success means it's one to three years. Intermediate, three to seven years. When we say long-term implant success, the implant should have been in function along with the prosthetic component at least for seven years. Survival. And we have something called as satisfactory survival, compromised survival. See, implants also have a compromised survival. It requires clinical treatment, but it can survive with treatment. Here, it is less than ideal, but still we don't need clinical management. See, see the different people have given different terminologies. Okay, when we say implant failure, when an implant is indicated for removal. Now, we have to look at some data where they have compared preserving a periodontally involved tooth or placing an implant, which is better. Now, look at this term systematic review. I think many of you may not be familiar with this. Very common term. Now, I say evidence-based practice, evidence-based dentistry. I cannot say, okay, I have done this for my patient and I can do this. We need to have a data. Okay, at least 10 people have done and this is what they have seen. So that is how it's, it's better than saying I have done this and it has worked for me. Saying 10 people have done it and it has worked for them is better. So this is how scientific evidence is built up. We have different studies, case control studies, cross-sectional studies, longitudinal studies. And now the uh, present, this thing is, we have to combine number of studies which are in a similar methodology and give combined results. I have done a study for 100 patients. Another individual has done 100 patients. Another person has done it for 100 patients. We combine the data and come up with results. That is what is called as a systematic review. It is not just a review which is written, which is based on knowledge. It is all statistical, combined statistical analysis. And this is at the highest level. It is considered as the pinnacle of evidence. We have a systematic review of our topic that is taken as an authority to take a decision. So this is the result of a systematic review. Now, this was done to answer this question. Does the long-term survival rate of implant compared to that of adequately treated, look at these terms, how strongly used, adequately treated and maintained natural teeth provides the clinician tools for evidence-based treatment planning when considering tooth extraction and implant placement. Look at this. Followed for more than 15 years, the failure rate varied from 3.6 to 13.4%, whereas for implants, it varied from 0 to 33%. Very clearly, it mentions higher rate for loss of implants than adequately treated and maintained teeth. What are the longevities of teeth and oral implant? Now, this was again done to analyze tooth loss, to evaluate the longevity of healthy teeth, compromised by diseases, influenced by therapy, as well as that of implants. Now, look at this again. Oral implants were evaluated after 10 years of service they did not surpass the longevity of even compromised but successfully treated natural teeth. Now, very important factor, cost analysis. Now, all this that I said is clinical data, okay, at clinically, the performance level. Of course, let's look at even the cost factor. Implants have typically enjoyed high long-term survival rates. Yes, no doubt. But the long-term financial impact to the patient can be much higher than saving the natural dentition because we are talking about implant maintenance. Again, implant is not something that we can place and just leave it. Any problem with the implants, the treatment of peri-implantitis, maintenance of that implant therapy, the cost factor adds up. Okay. So conservative valuations place initial cost for implant treatment around two to three times higher than saving natural dentition. Again, there are implant complications which are associated with additional treatment costs. Now, this is again the same thing, number of disease-free years and the cost factor. We are considering both, okay? So, again, here, if you see, the number of disease-free years was the same for the natural teeth, for the contralateral teeth and implants. But when there is peri-implantitis, the cost for maintaining the implants was much higher than cost of maintaining the natural teeth. So, it is definitely a more expensive affair for the patient. Now, this is one study which was done on teeth with furcation involvement. 
here again, the results are almost the same. So retaining the sparkation involved molars is more cost effective than replacing them with implants. Now, to sum up, I just uh, want to summarize what all we did. You know, we first studied about various factors that we consider to decide on the prognosis because to extract or not to extract, we need to decide on the prognosis. So we need to know the factors, then various classification schemes. And then of course, one elaborate decision-making process to decide for extraction. What we do after extraction, a little information on implants versus natural teeth, long-term prognosis of periodontally treated teeth, which we saw in many studies, which is very good. Then comparing the long-term prognosis of implants versus long-term prognosis of periodontally treated and maintained teeth. Very important. We just don't say periodontally treated. So we come to the conclusion of the presentation. So we've seen there are many factors which we have to consider before we decide whether we have to salvage the tooth, save the tooth or extract and place implant. We have to consider long-term economic impact as well as long-term success. Both implants and periodontal therapy to save natural teeth have high initial success rates. But of course, we have high initial costs for the implants. But when we look at long-term retention rates, Natural teeth often demonstrate lesser complications and a smaller financial impact when correction is needed. Thank you all for the silent uh, listening. Thank you, ma'am, for this wonderful and very informative uh, session. I now ask uh, Dr. Ghazala, to take over. Thank you, ma'am. It was a lovely session. I'm sure the pin drop silent was because you were so clear in your uh, uh, presentation, every single point so crystal clear. And I think everybody would have understood such a complicated chart. Actually, even when I was going through the article, I found it so elaborate and so complicated. But now after your explanation, it has become, you know, I, I felt like I was back into the classroom and, and the topic has become easy for me now. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Okay, um, I welcome Dr. Fezuddin, sir, and uh, I'm so, so happy uh, that uh, you have joined us, sir. And uh, before we could go on to the question and answer uh, session, sir, I would request you if you could please add on uh, some points from your side regarding the topic, preservation versus restoration of a tooth. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamualaikum, all of you. Uh, at the outside, I would like to thank Global Dental Professionals for giving me this opportunity to be here and to participate in this webinar. Well, if I look at the things, if I look back, I really 55 years of my professional life, I see that dentistry has undergone a sea change. When I got into dental college in 66, uh, the teacher who introduced us to dentistry he said, a good dentist is one who can pull out a tooth without much pain and discomfort and replace it with a functional, aesthetically acceptable artificial substitute. That was the dentistry. And one who could do it is a very good dental surgeon. But the things have changed over the years. Dentistry has undergone a sea change. Our knowledge about the etiopathogenesis has widened. Thanks to technology, new materials have come to market. There are new technologies. The new treatment modalities have developed. Things have changed. Not only that, with this, even our responsibility also has changed. Today, we live in an era of evidence-based medicine and evidence-based dentistry. We practice evidence-based medicine and evidence-based dentistry. See, we are answerable to whatever we do. At the same time, there is a new trend now that is known as P4 medicine or P4 dentistry. That means the dentistry is preventive in future, prognostic, 
personalize and participate. So whatever you do, actually the patient is one of the participants. He should be quite clear and he should be know what is being done on him and how it is going to help him. Especially when we talk of preservation or restoration of the tooth, where you are going to resort to some uh, surgical treatment or you are going to remove the tooth. That means you are taking a very drastic decision and your patient should know why it is done. That's why, because in these days of evidence-based medicine and dentistry, when you extract a tooth, you should be able to convince your patient why this tooth has to be extracted. Otherwise, tomorrow I will ask you, why did not you save my tooth? I went through the literature. They say the tooth could be saved and he will sue you. But that is the thing. There are many legal issues. So, uh, Pauzia, as usual, uh, you are very clear, concise, and to the point, your presentation was very fine and you have made things very clear. And uh, that uh, Mish and Awail, uh, Alai, what is that his name? Uh, that, uh, and associate, whatever that uh, chart they have developed, though it looks complicated, it actually is a very practical thing. I feel that every practitioner should be conversant with that nowadays because of why he is going to extract tooth and how he is going to place uh, whatever artificial substitute which is going to be there. And he has to justify that. So it is a very important. And I feel that uh, you have selected a very good topic so that everyone should be aware of this thing. Uh, that's the thing. And of course, uh, Faisal has made it very clear. Now the things have changed and the modern dentistry, the aim of modern dentistry is to restore the natural dentition and to maintain it in a optimal functional and in a state of health. And of course, in a optimal uh, aesthetics thing. That is how it should be for the lifetime of an individual. That is the thing. So that is the aim of the dentistry. And also, as she quoted the Divan's quotation, even whatever uh, artificial substitute you give, actually its uh, main function is to preserve the perpetual preservation of what remains rather than the meticulous replacement of what is missing. So uh, the thing is restorative dentistry and of course the prosthetic dentistry, they all go hand in hand. So we should take all these things into consideration in the treatment plan. So uh, it is very important that people should be conversant about the decision making about extraction of a tooth. It's very yes, important. Not that uh, just make the patient sit and tell him, I'm telling you, this is good for you. So I'm going to extract a tooth and give an artificial substitute. That's not the thing. Uh, Fauzi, in your discussion, uh, you made it very clear what is the difference between an implant and the best artificial substitutes with a gold standard of artificial substitute that is implant. You did not mention about the dentogingival junction, that unique structure in the human body and the role it plays in protecting the underlying tissues, which is missing in the implant surface. That is very important. Uh, that's the thing. Uh, it is a very good uh, presentation and very good topic. And there was a very good response. They were all very silent. And there were some questions also appeared on the screen. I think you should be able to, Jose, uh, I should be uh, able to clear these doubts. So once again, uh, that is the thing. It is a very good presentation. The Jose asked, somebody asked, what is surgical re-entry? If he's a practitioner, let him not try that. I tell him it is something which is meant for research, uh, surgical reentry. <laughs> okay. And uh, there was one more uh, question which appeared on the screen. What is osteoception and proprioception? Please make it very clear because it is very, very important. Thank you, Thank sir. You, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, I 
I would like to uh, acknowledge Sir's help for this presentation. Today morning, I was with Sir to kind of have my uh, presentation uh, reviewed by him once. So he made some corrections. So that's one thing of having Sir around. Sir's corrections, Sir's uh, way of positively giving the feedback is what uh, keeps me going and encouraging. I would take this opportunity to wish my teacher a very, very happy Teacher's Day. I Thank should say you. these are very happy moments for me, sir, to share the platform with you. So may the Almighty bless all your students with your guidance for a long, long time. Amen. Thank you, sir. Sir, even I would like to mention something to everyone here. Um, although I am just a very, uh, you know, small student and uh, he never, never, uh, you know, uh, misses my call. He always gets back to me for all my messages. He responds to all my queries and he is always so warm. He says, Ajao ghar pe, let us sit and discuss, you know, out of his busy schedule. He is still, uh, you know, very actively involved in the university and so many more programs like the Bangalore Academy of Periodontists. And, uh, you know, and yet he's always there for his students, be it, you know, uh, in the college or even now when I'm practicing, he's always there. And I, I'm sure all his students will have this to say about him. Thank you so much, sir. You're welcome. And a very, very happy Teacher's Day from us. Thank you. So let's begin the question answer session. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we've got uh, quite a few questions and uh, they're very interesting questions. We'll all answer it together, Ghazala. <laughs> ma'am, you will <laughs> definitely answer it very nicely, ma'am. Uh, better than me. Okay. Uh, um, the first question is from Dr. Shiraj Pasha, sir. And uh, he, uh, his question is, what is surgical re-entry? Please elaborate. Okay, see, there are the various methods to assist uh, the periodontal treatment that is done. In specific, when we do periodontal regeneration, where we place bone grafts, some uh, guided tissue regeneration, membranes. See, we have to assess the outcome. So for that, there are various methods. So one is clinical measure, which is the probing pocket depth. Then we take radiographs. And there are some advanced uh, bone scans that is computed tomography, subtraction uh, radiography and all that. The most authentic measure is to reflect a flap, check for the presence of bone. In fact, histological specimens are taken to check whether it is bone or it is mere fibrous tissue which is formed there. So this is another surgical opening that is done. So as Sir mentioned, this is not meant for the practitioners. It is done at research level. Okay, the next question is, how is uh, osteoperception different from proprioception? Please guide. See, proprioception is a very simple term. The nerve stimulation, the presence of sensory receptors in a tissue which carry the nerve innovation. That is proprioception. And periodontal ligament has a number of sensory receptors. One of the functions of periodontal ligament is sensory function. If we remember, you know, it has... a uh, physical function, remodeling function, nutritive and sensory function. So it has nerve endings. So it fulfills the uh, criteria of proprioception. Now, in the presence of periodontal ligament, uh, sorry, absence of periodontal ligament, that is the implant, which is directly fused through the bone. So this concept of osteoperception is explained in that context. So they say there is some amount of sensation that is passed on through the bone via the TMJ. See what is happening at the occlusal level. Okay, it's, it's a very refined concept, very difficult to explain. But at the gross level, this is what it is. There is no nerve innovation there. So directly via the bone. Sir, am I right? Uh, yeah, the best, if somebody wants to know what is the difference, uh, what he has to do is take one peanut. And if he has got uh, an implant-supported uh, denture in his anterior, just hold it for uh, two minutes without biting on that. If there is no proprioception, he will not be able to judge what is the amount of pressure he is using. So he will bite on it so hard that it will break. If there are natural teeth, because of proprioception, he knows what is the pressure to be used so that he should not bite that, so that it should not break. So that is one thing. One can easily make out the difference between proprioception and osteoception. 
and there's a continuation to this question uh, by Dr. Garcia itself. Also, is there a faint possibility of providing an artificial proprioceptive system for dental implants like other parts of the body? If we could do that, then we will regenerate periodontal ligaments. <laughs> And uh, recently, I have read an article, and uh, not recently, I think from the past, uh, in the past decade, they've been trying to do this. In the quest uh, to get science mimic nature, what they are trying to do is make something called as liga plants. So li li liga plants are something that mimic a periodontal ligament around implants, where they are doing a periodontal stem cell tissue regeneration. They're planning to coat it around the implant and they're planning to, uh, you know, take it from the same patient. Take it from the patient who is going to receive the implant, regenerate it and coat that implant surface, customize it for that patient and get it back. Now, like Sir told, uh, P4 dentistry, so we are, we are advancing towards it, you know, patient-centric dentistry. I think so we are in the pathway to that. Have you read this article, uh, Ghazala? Yes, sir. There are many, many articles on the... Yeah, the thing is, there... Uh, how they have identified those uh, stem cells? Where they, What is the source of stem cells for this work? Mm, so the thing is, many a times what they have done, uh, they have harvested cells from the periodontal ligament, ligament and that they have used it and they claim that they have used stem cells. No, that is not the thing. Nowadays, there are markers for stem cells and with that, they have to select a pluripotent stem cell because we are using adult stem cells. We must know that they have got its own limitation. So most of this research work has some basic shortcoming. Anyhow, we will hope always it is like that. In the beginning, we have to experiment with all that. And finally, we will succeed. That's how we have reached this stage. That's it. I thought I should uh, add this point. Yes, sir. thank you. Definitely. So going on to the next question. Um, can we do immediate implant placement for a periodontally involved tooth? If yes, what is the prognosis? Kindly guide Dr. Asmat Jahan. See, when we say periodontally compromised tooth, we should remember that there is bone level which is compromised. And one of the prerequisite for implant placement is having adequate healthy bone. So if we are having adequate height and width of the bone to place the implant of the required size for that particular area, we can definitely. Now, this question can be taken in two contexts. One is this patient is a periodontitis patient. There is periodontitis in the other areas of the oral, I mean, the, the dentition. And then one particular tooth we are extracting. And then we're saying whether we can place it. See, yes, there have been studies where a patient with periodontitis implant is placed and it is successful in that. Because I mentioned periodontitis is site specific. So the presence of periodontitis in the other areas will not affect the implant success or integration process in that site. If we are talking about the remaining bone, yes, then again, we are talking about extracting the tooth, augmenting the bone, waiting for bone to form, which is adequate for implant placement, place the implant. Or if it is marginal deficiency, place the implant with simultaneous augmentation. Now, for the success in these situations, there are a number of factors that play a role. Can I add something? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, you must all have heard of Dr. Virendra from Bangalore. He is promoting uh, his basal implants. Uh, he will uh, actually place it uh, implant after extraction in a periodontally involved tooth, and he will load it also immediately. And uh, I have seen some patients who are quite happy, but still uh, those cases, they are not being observed for a very long period of time, but uh, that I have seen that that, that could be done uh, without osteointegration, but I don't know because it's a time only is a better guy, uh, you know, deciding factor. We must see how long these uh, implants are going to be lost, but uh, that is being done. Yes. And not only that, they also splint the implants, you know, that what is known as cold welding in the patient's mouth. They put multiple implants and splint them. But of course, here, whatever the bone, they, they don't augment the ridge, but they take support from two cortical plates, the bicortical, actually. That's how it is. Yeah. Uh, there's one question, I mean, a, a question which is related to the previous question. Um, isn't the concept of periodontal healing related to regeneration, Dr. Ali? 
See, when we say regeneration, regeneration is nothing but its type of healing. If you all remember our general pathology classes, when we say different types of healing, healing by primary intention, healing by secondary intention, healing by repair, healing by regeneration. regeneration. So regeneration is nothing but ideal form of healing. Repair is compromised form of healing. So it's the same. And... Um... Com coming back to proprioception, I have two more questions, so I will club it up. Ma'am and sir, I'm very curious to know, and my uh, query could be a bit silly, but please apologize. Any difference in gingival proprioception in children with sensory processing disorder in kids? And also one more thing, in special needs children, gingival proprioception, is, is, is there any difference than the normal individuals? And if there are any research uh, published, please give us your opinion. Dr. Gausia. Is it a question of my Dr. Gaussia? Because she has done a lot of work. She should only answer this. <laughs> I think uh, yeah. she is well informed about it. Dr. Gaussia? Yeah. Could you please yeah. give in your inputs? Uh, Dr. Safia, can you unmute Dr. Gaussia, please? Uh, Dr. Garcia, you there? Uh, yes, doctor. Um, uh, it's just a doubt which I want uh, sir and ma'am to address. You know, it's a silly doubt, but then I would want your perspective on this. So what do you think? I mean, how much uh, of research or I know there's a very scanty research on it, but how do yeah. you so much? Uh, of so the thing is, I don't have uh, sort to say a clear idea about it, but uh, I feel that there is some difference between uh, gingival perception and uh, periodontal perception. See, the thing is, we must go back to the evolution of dentition. If you see in the lower animals, actually the teeth were fused to the bone. Okay. And then uh, in the mammalian dentition, the periodontal ligament appear okay. and it has got its own functions, you know, depending upon the food habits and all. So it is something highly evolved structure is the periodontal ligament. But the gingiva is there in all animals, both lower and highly evolved animals. So I think in the very structure, God Almighty must have thought of all these things very well. <laughs> so there might be some difference between periodontal ligament and the gingiva, but that we have to explore. What is the difference? Okay. Okay. That is actually his science. That is Tadabur. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And there's a very interesting question from Dr. Khausia. Dr. Khausia again. When does oral proprioception develop? Or is it limited to gingival and periodontal experience only with the eruption of teeth? And this is just getting mystery to me. So no better uh, chance to, you know, explore. And uh, as anxious and curious I am to listen from the pioneers. These doubts are like piled up uh, within me from long. <laughs> I mean, from my uh, personal experience, not as a periodontist, but as a mother, <laughs> I see that my kid who is just 10, year, 10 months old and who has not yet developed her teeth, she tends to keep biting and, you know, trying to yes. Uh, yes. get the, you know, feel yes. of everything that she is chewing onto. Yeah, so, probably that's not a fully developed proprioception. But yes, I, I feel personally, not as a periodontist and not on based on research, but as a, a mother of a 10-month-old 10 10 kid. Sir, anything from your side? See, the thing is, uh, I think uh, for this, we have to read fraud. Okay, sir. See, because there, everything actually is expressed and pursued through mouth. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how it is. Uh, it's a very complicated thing. Those who are interested, you better read about it. Uh, that uh, That's why the child takes everything and put it in the mouth. Yes, sir because that is a very sensitive organ and yes. he can make out. So mm -hmm. that is the thing, it is the oral cavity is something which we still have not completely understood. It's a very uh, complicated st structure. Okay. Okay. Especially the mucosa, the teeth and the periodontal ligament. Especially the evolution of periodontal ligament. Yes. Gomphosis that uh, you must have studied during our uh, first year, second year days. But actually, that is something we should be taught at a postgraduate level because it's so complicated, I think. 
Um, the next question is from Dr. Asim. Uh, kindly a note on regrowth tissue peridon, uh, per tissue, periodontal tissue like nanofibrous membrane. Periodontal tissue regrowth. I think he wants to know on periodontal okay. tissue regrowth. Regeneration. Regeneration. It's regeneration. Yes, like it's nanofibrous membrane. Yes. See, when we talk about periodontal regeneration, there are many questions still unanswered. Initially, when we're talking about regeneration, treating periodontal patients, it was all about bone regeneration. But then at one point of time, it was realized it's not only bone that we need. We need to have a healthy cementum layer and a new periodontal ligament that should form. So all the research is stagnant at the level of regenerating the periodontal ligament. And very difficult to regenerate cementum. I think this has got to do with some tissue engineering concept. That's what he basically wants to know. Um, the temporal yeah. aspect, that is the thing, because... The spatial um, arrangement. Yes, the periodontal ligament fibers should form and then they should get embedded into the cementum. That means cementum should form after the formation of periodontal ligament. Okay. So the time factor is very important. There are so many things which still not very clear to us. Uh, going on to the next question, are we planning or to... If it is not out of purpose, I would like to yes. share something with you. Yes. Uh, one day I happened to meet one uh, a person who is uh, working on stem cells. And uh, I just mentioned that I am a dental surgeon. Uh, we are thinking of uh, regenerating periodontal ligament. He listened to me and said, uh, he told me, I'm sorry to say, doctor, probably that may not be possible during your lifetime and my lifetime because we can regenerate your heart, we can regenerate liver, all that we can do, but not the periodontal structure because there is cementum, bone, gingiva. And so the number type of cells are different. It is a very complicated thing. But still, he said, I appreciate your uh, optimism that you are trying to regenerate periodontal He said, that, that is the thing. That is the words why I, an expert in the field. True, sir. Okay, going on to the next question. Are we planning to implement the new periodontal classification in practice in India, ma'am? Dr. Ali. Yes, we have to, though as of now, it seems to be very complicated, is not part of the textbooks yet. So it is not in the teaching curriculum still at the undergraduate level. So if it is globally accepted, then we also have to accept it. It should become part of the curriculum, then it comes into the level of practice. And uh, on a lighter note, Dr. Nadim wants to ask, uh, do classifications change because of insurance companies? Yes, actually, Such this is answer. the perception nowadays. Many people think that the present classification is developed only for the sake of insurance companies. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the next question is uh, by Dr. Ali. Do you believe, which, uh, what do you believe? Which implants are better for uh, periodontium, basal or conventional? See, the thing is simple. When to use which one? I think the question should be that. See, the bone, we have alveolar bone, we have basal bone. If we have adequate alveolar bone, then it is definitely our conventional root form implants. If there is deficient alveolar bone, the implant has to go into basal bone, so that becomes basal implant. It's simple. Ma'am, and uh, one, one question from my side. When we do implants in the alveolar bone, and when there is some form of an implant failure or a bone loss, we always have the scope to get back into that area, regenerate the bone. But what about uh, implants that are, you know, ruthlessly placed in the, uh, you know, uh, basal bone, which is like the hard bone. And once you destroy it, you know, how, how, how good is the, you know, reformation? Or does it even regenerate? No, see, the I mean, proponents of basal implants, what they say is there's no bone. We have to give some kind of replacement to the, see, when there is no, no other option left. We no, have to manage now, it what is left. But nowadays the practice is like even when there are there is an amount good amount of bone because you can get teeth immediately, people are opting for basal bone and they are advocating that basal bone is much better than. Uh, See, as sir mentioned, we don't have long term. Now when we say long term, long term is not four years, five years. We have to have studies which are at least minimum more than ten years. So only with follow up of minimum ten years, we can say whether the long term outcome of this is going in what direction. 
there is a, always an exception for a rule. Uh, actually, uh, one of my friend, he was uh, an implantologist. Probably he is the first or second implant, implantologist of Bangalore City, Dr. Ravindra Rao. Now he's no more in practice. And he had placed one uh, bicortical screw. Those days, there used to be one system known as bicortical, this uh, oral tronics. They used to have what is called bicortical screw. He had placed uh, for the replacement of anterior teeth for a patient bicortical screws. And that was in last millennium. <laughs> that was before 2000. <laughs> and uh, that patient maintains a very good oral hygiene. Uh, at that time, she was a very young lady. Now she's a grown up lady. Now, but still, she has those implants and uh, she goes for a regular checkup. Sometimes uh, she calls me and tells me that I want that you should have a look at my implants uh, because you have been looking after it for the past nearly 20, 25 years. That's how it is. So there are exceptions, but uh, as I told you, that uh, that cannot be taken as a strong evidence. That's the thing. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is by Dr. Syed Bashiruddin. Is implant the best option for replacement in children too? No, because see, we consider jaw growth till one particular age. So till the complete growth of jawbone has been achieved, implants are definitely not advised because it is a definitive option which is considered for long term. The position of the implant can change with the growth of the jaw. So it is not advisable. Yes, there are exceptions as sir said. Some situations, if it is a real hard necessity, they try in place, but otherwise, it is definitely better to wait for the complete jaw growth to occur. Uh, the next question is, how long should we wait after the supportive periodontal therapy? Dr. Asmat Jahan. See, this is not a question which can be answered with one session. We have seen the patient, we have treated the patient, and then we decide. This is, okay, sorry, this is saying how long to wait after SPD. See, any form of periodontal therapy we have done, whether it is active periodontal therapy or it is supportive periodontal therapy, after after we have done scaling and root planning, we at least wait for six weeks to evaluate the results. In case of situations where we have used some regenerative material, the wait is even longer. It is minimum three months. To see some radiographic changes, it's almost around six months. Okay. Um, the next question is, prognosis of implants in smokers. And um, smoking is a very significant risk factor for periodontal disease and for implant success. That is what I can tell. I think the question says also, you know, whether the patient can smoke immediately after the implant placement. You know, some people have the opinion, we place the implant for one week, the patient doesn't smoke, then it's fine. No, it's not like that. Smoking significantly affects all aspects, you know, immunity, the kind of microbiota that accumulates in the oral cavity, the pattern of healing, everything is affected. So smoking is a very strong risk factor and all the patients should and must be informed. No, uh, probably the person who has asked this question, he wants to know whether smoking is a contraindication for, for implant placement. So that again is very difficult to answer, sir. <laughs> Okay, we have uh, quite an elaborate question here, I think, by Dr. Nayak Hiddos. Uh, the recent trend these days is the subperiosteal frame implants. What is your opinion about this? As the concept is very old and not much predictable results. In the Middle East and some parts of Europe, people are vouching for this uh, as the solution for atrophic ridges. Your experience on it, sir. Uh, the question is to Fezuddin, sir. Uh, see, I am not in implants. Please excuse me. I don't know much about it. I'm, I'm an old timer. Still, I believe in <laughs> saying natural teeth. So, how about uh, Dr. Nair itself uh, giving us some uh, information? Because I'm sure that uh, you know much more than all of us here about implants. Uh, uh, no, sorry, uh, because I, I don't want to misguide you with my when I am not very certain. About no, sir, um, Dr. Nair. Uh, so actually, the thing is, much into periodontium and then the field of periodontia for a very long time. I wanted your expertise on this matter because uh, a day in and day out here, there are people who are vouching for this kind of uh, 
uh, technology wherein they are claiming that there's a 3D printed frames. Now, actually what they do is they scan the jaws, atrophic, severely atrophic jaws, and then uh, they create a frame. They, they either cast it or they mill it. And then uh, they just uh, give a screw retain processes over it. Uh, but then they say this is the, I mean, uh, uh, trend now in the future. And this is the only solution for uh, atrophic ridges. I mean, uh, what exactly are they actually uh, watching for or the claiming? I mean, this septal implant is not a new trend or a new concept. Uh, Dr. Nair, of what I have read, you know, we have read this at the historical aspects of uh, implantology. You know, we have read about the septal frameworks. This basically yeah, yeah. takes the entire palatal. Uh, Dr. Masla, could you mute your, mute your, mute your mic, please? Dr. Safia, could you look into yes, this? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, again, see, this depends. If you're talking about long term success rates of this concept, it all depends on the amount of occlusal force the patients will have because the framework is being supported to the bone via small screws. It's like, you know, how we use the plate and screw concept for the fractured bone. Similar concept. So the force transmission happens to the entire, we have a broad surface area for the force transmission. There have been variable success rates for this. Now, why this is being watched for or why this is being opted for now is basically, you know, we have situations where there is atrophic ridges. We have to have some solution for the patients. And there are no, uh, the contraindications for this is same as for any other implant placement. Uh, I mean, are you suggesting that implants are the only solution for replacement of atrophic ridges or, uh, I mean, uh, for replacement of prosthetic reapplication? Of course, yes. See, if we have completely edentulous uh, patients and if they are wanting some fixed uh, uh, option, uh, we have to look into implants only. And if we don't have enough alveolar bone to place the conventional implants, and also if the patient is not wanting the basal implants for its own advantages and disadvantages, this should definitely be another option. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Um, one last question. Uh, usually what happens in the clinical scenario is people come with mobile lower anteriors and they're very skeptical about extracting them. So many dentists opt for splinting of the lower anteriors canine to canine. What's your take on this? Should it be splinted? If yes, for how long? And uh, what should be the considerations a dentist, as a general dentist, uh, what should be the considerations uh, going in ahead with splinting? See, now, if we are not splinting, we have to extract the teeth. Now, whether to extract or not to extract, we've had an elaborate discussion on it. We have to you know, look into so many factors, the overall factors, the local factors, the amount of remaining bone, how the patient can maintain, whether the patient is compliant or not. So considering all this, we have decided to save the teeth. Now, the teeth are mobile. We are providing periodontal therapy to the patient. See, splinting is not a treatment modality. We use splinting so that we give stability to the tooth when healing is happening. Okay, splinting is definitely a very good option, but then we have to look at whether it is going to be temporary stabilization, which goes for a few weeks, or it goes for provisional concept for a few months, or it becomes a concept of permanent stability for the patient. Keep the teeth as long as you want. Come back to us for maintenance and till you take a final call or whether you want to maintain them like this with the additional visits to the dentist regularly for maintenance or you want a permanent option. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Safia, have I missed out on any other questions? No, ma'am. Okay. Any other questions from the um, attendees? Any, any, any other queries? Can I add something on splinting? Yes, sir. Please. Uh, See, I have treated many cases of lower anteriors with splint and maintained those teeth for a very long time. But only thing is, when you splint it, see that the splint is only in the incisal one third and the interdental spaces are maintained so that the patient can use an interdental brush or floss and keep that area clean. With that, uh, in my personal experience, that is not an evidence, but anyhow, but I have seen that uh, you can maintain like that, uh, the compromised lower anteriors for a very long time, for even 10 years. I have a case which is maintained for more, almost 10 years. And definitely uh, 
we as periodontists believe that uh, maintaining uh, teeth is much more pocket friendly to the patient than maintaining and uh, placing an implant. So we will always ad advocate uh, saving, preserving teeth and we are always in uh, war with the surgeons who... Pocket, <laughs> pocket friendly for us also. The patient is so happy that we preserve <laughs> the natural teeth and number of times the patient comes and you definitely yeah. have an upper hand because you have saved the teeth for the patient. You have saved the teeth at the same time you have actually... Uh, made money house so because okay. he keeps coming very often coming to us okay we have another question uh, from dr nadim is what a uh, what a pick should be advised regularly after periodontal treatment uh, over flossing i don't think definitely not for an indian scenario every patient cannot afford a water pick and we definitely no need a water pick for every patient there are in fact specific indications for even chemical plaque control Simple mechanical plaque control with a brush that is manual tooth brushing is more than enough unless we have additional factors. Of course, Dr. Nadim must be asking this because most of his patients are ortho patients. Yes, if you have a patient who is poor at the uh, oral hygiene maintenance, who is undergoing orthodontic treatment, then definitely, yes, water pick is definitely advisable. Patients with implants, patients with too much of prosthetic restorations in the oral cavity where there are difficult areas, you know, the patient cannot use a floss. The uh, conventional tooth brushing is not efficient in maintaining plaque control, then yes, not for every patient. Okay. We must always keep one thing in mind that plaque is a biofilm that has to be mechanically scrubbed. Scrubbed. Yes. And uh, whatever <clears throat> you use as antimicrobial topical application, whether it is with a water pick or any other source may not be very effective. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, I think uh, this we come to the end of question. Any more question and questions from the audience? Should I think somebody has asked, what is a water pick? It is basically an irrigation device, you know, to dislodge the food debris which is accumulated either in the interproximal areas or below a uh, crown or adjacent to an implant area. So it's a mechanical device. You know, we use syringes for irrigation. So these are mechanical devices which are meant for irrigation. Okay. So I think uh, we're done with the questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, sir. It, it has indeed been an amazing session. And it's a wonderful way to end a Sunday and to end uh, the teacher's day, especially for me with my two favorite teachers. And uh, I'm so happy to even sit in front of sir and, you know, pose Put, put forward some questions and uh, and I'm sure that the audience also have had an amazing time with so much uh, take home points, so much to learn. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Fazuddin sir, Fauzia ma'am, uh, our host. Uh, yes, sir. yes sir. I have one uh, suggestion that there are many youngsters who are very well informed and very good at uh, communication uh, in future, try to avoid all very senior people because they have become outdated and encourage the youngster. That is very important. We must always encourage the younger generation, the youngsters. Hmm? Yeah. So I think. Sir, but, uh, sir, but mere presence of a senior person makes a lot of difference. So we are all streamlined. We are all very disciplined. At least for that, we need to have. You invite me for your programs. I will be there. But you give chance to the youngsters. Yes, sir. Mm, that is very important. If we don't, uh, I mean, uh, encourage the second generation, then we will have problems. Thank you, sir. And uh, uh, I, on behalf of Team GDP, um, I am a newcomer to GDP, but I definitely uh, am thankful to the entire team because um, even in the last webinar series, we saw so many youngsters uh, who gave in their uh, webinars. And even I think in this time's webinar 2.0, there are a lot of uh, youngsters who, have, uh, who are ready to you know, present their sessions. So brace yourselves, watch out for all the webinars which are going to come, inshallah. And uh, uh, you know, we will be posting it uh, soon. Uh, the recorded session of this uh, webinar will be available on our YouTube channel the global dental professionals. So don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And um, that's it from uh, us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, have a very nice day. Thank you, audience. And thank you, uh, uh, GDP core member teams for giving us this opportunity. Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.